Welcome back to the Ricina Fireside. This time, I'm joined by my dear friend, Lynn Kwok, Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow, who works at the IISS in Singapore. Lynn, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Samir. It's good to be here. So as the curtain falls on the Ricina stage, uh, one of the enduring questions that was raised across many conversations was on the future of the Indo-Pacific. And many would argue that that is deeply tied with the future of the ASEAN itself. And Singapore, perhaps, is one of the central pillars of that particular grouping. So my question to you would be, uh, Lynn, um, the Ukraine crisis, in some sense, tells us that Singapore is an outlier. Uh, what does that indicate about the group dynamics, Singapore's relationship with the ASEAN countries? And also, how do you th be, uh, what do you think does Singapore see itself as, as an ASEAN actor, as a part of the developed world, as a part of the liberal order? How do you believe this is going to change the dynamics within ASEAN? Thanks so much, uh, Samir, for that question. I think the first point to note is that all of ASEAN, save um, Vietnam as well as Laos, uh, voted in favor of the resolution um, condemning uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, so there was some unity there. However, you are right in saying that Singapore was an outlier in the sense that its position on Russia-Ukraine was actually the strongest amongst the ASEAN states. So apart from its vote at the UN General Assembly, uh, it also uh, chose to impose sanctions. Mm -hmm. it, it joined with other like-minded countries in imposing sanctions, something that it rarely does. It only does so usually in the case where there is a binding Security Council decision on the imposition of sanctions. So yes, Singapore was a bit of an outlier in that respect. Um, that said, um, you know, ASEAN's vote was all over the place, as some people might say, uh, in respect of whether or not um, uh, Russia should be expelled from the Human Rights Council. But, you know, you really don't have to look uh, towards uh, the Ukraine vote or the Ukraine crisis to see that there are deep divisions within mm -hmm. ASEAN, and ASEAN finds it very hard to come to a common agreement or consensus on a lot of issues because of their relationship with the United States. You know, uh, some are closer to the United States than, other, than others. Their relationship with China as well, some are closer to the United States than others. And, you know, on various other issues, you know, each one takes a slightly different position. And I, but I think if we look at the challenges confronting ASEAN or the Southeast Asian region as a whole, these are many. You've got US-China geopolitical competition, which is squeezing ASEAN. You have also, and they don't often talk about this, but you know, increasingly assertive Chinese actions as well. And of course, you have a fear in um, Southeast Asia of you know, a United States that is increasingly confrontational, um, th that they feel is you know, unproductively confrontational vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. And I think what ASEAN needs to, f to be able to do is to find unity um, in principles, a principled-based approach. And so ASEAN needs to you know, decide for themselves whether they want to live in a world where principles and international law rules or whether it's about might mm -hmm. is right. And no, I think no, it's quite clear the choice. So, so let me ask you that question. Uh, in fact, I, I think you kind of hinted at that. Uh, if ASEAN cannot unite and, and respond collectively to challenges, uh, what would happen if you were to see Chinese action in the South China Sea? Mm -hmm. Would you see a divided ASEAN response, uh, leaving the country to fend for itself? Or uh, do you believe that uh, when something is geographically proximate, you might see a more collective um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, mobilization across the countries? Yeah, I think we've seen um, already as it stands that um, countries are left to fend for themselves in respect of more aggressive Chinese actions. China has encroached, despite the tribunal ruling in the South China Sea case, um, in the Philippines case against China in 2016, mm -hmm. China has continued to encroach upon the exclusive economic zones of various uh, Southeast Asian uh, coastal states. And, um, you know, in each of these respects, countries have responded uh, individually to push back against um, 
Chinese encroachments. Um, and ASEAN has been quite quiet about that, save calling for respect for international law, including mm -hmm. UNCLOS, or the United Nations mm -hmm. Convention on the Law of the Sea. That said, I think we've seen some degree of, um, it's not collective or joint action in the sense, but um, many more ASEAN countries now have submitted statements to the UN. Um, it's a commission on the law of the, um, on the continental shelf. I mean, it's a very technical um, grouping, but, but it's submitted statements to the United Nations, which uh, taken together, all these statements all clearly reject China's um, expansive claims, um, mm -hmm. maritime claims mm -hmm. in the South China Sea, as well as make clear that they support either implicitly or explicitly the uh, South China Sea Tribunal ruling. So I think that is some progress, but you know, in general, countries are fending for themselves. So there were two observations, uh, recent observations. One of them you pointed to uh, US being more confrontational, uh, ASEAN having the luxury of being ambiguous, no longer being available to them, uh, US forcing um, some of the countries to act in a certain way. Mm -hmm. There is also another observation that Chinese have a veto within the ASEAN as well. Mm -hmm. A couple of actors within the ASEAN um, ensure that collective responses to certain common uh, issues mm -hmm. are not going to uh, move in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. Now, how does ASEAN balance this big power politics where it seems to be uh, at the core of it? In some sense, there is a jostling for uh, the soul of ASEAN, uh, if I was to uh, you know, address it like that. Well I, well, I think ASEAN has responded to geopolitical competition um, in, I would say, three ways. First way, um, is to reassert or seek to reassert ASEAN centrality. Um, but in a sense, there's, there's no magic in the incantation of ASEAN. Um, it doesn't happen just because you say it's central, right? It doesn't become central just because mm -hmm. you say mm -hmm. it's central. And um, I think what needs to happen uh, is for ASEAN member states to actually be committed um, to taking the necessary decisions that make ASEAN central. And this might mean, of course, um, taking a more enlightened view rather than a narrow parochial view of what is in their national interest. It might also mean, in some instances, not bowing um, mm -hmm. to big power, uh, uh, big, um, a big country's um, whim or mm -hmm. demands. Mm -hmm. So that's one way it's uh, responding, um, assertions of ASEAN centrality. The other way it's responding is seeking to rely and calling for adherence to international law. Mm -hmm. And I think it, this is a good thing because international law, of course, benefits both small mm -hmm. and large mm -hmm. countries mm -hmm. and provides um, a buffer um, mm -hmm. against, uh, for small countries against um, uh, big power dynamics and competition. Uh, this one, I think it's been slightly more successful at, um, as I mentioned, you know, more and more ASEAN countries are actually making stronger statements about the rule of law. So that's a good thing as well. And the third thing I've see, I think we've seen um, ASEAN do to respond to great power competition is um, it sought to bring in uh, or sought to have other powers besides the United States and um, China more engaged with the region, both strategically or security-wise, but also economically. And what this does, of course, is that it helps to balance mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. power in the region, and it moves away from you know this sort of U.S.-China clash, the binary. yeah, mm -hmm. to this binary thing, to you know it being about you know countries who are interested in a rules-based mm -hmm. order being present in the region and supporting that. Um, the other thing that it does as well for ASEAN is that it helps to. Pres uh, uh, provide ASEAN as well as its member states mm -hmm. with more strategic options. Say there's economic coercion, it has a fallback in terms of you know other economic partners that it can partner with. No, I mean just as a just continuing that conversation, mm -hmm. uh, how do now let me flip it around? How do big powers view ASEAN? Do they prefer to do business bilaterally, mm -hmm. or do you believe that they truly invest in the collective? Mm -hmm. uh, is ASEAN lip service? the invocation of ASEAN lip service while the real deals are done bilaterally? Or do you still think that ASEAN has uh, a standing in others' eyes? I think it depends on which power you're talking about. So I think with China, it's been quite clear that China has been um, quite uh, assiduous in engaging ASEAN um, or Southeast Asia 
at all levels. So mm -hmm. bilaterally, minilaterally, but also multilaterally as well. And we see this multilateral engagement in terms of you know, the ASEAN-China uh, defense minister's informal mm -hmm. meeting, mm -hmm. and also China seeking to elevate relations between um, ASEAN and China to a comprehensive strategic partnership. Mm -hmm. um, with countries like the United States, um, we see spasmodic um, attempts, mm -hmm. um, uh, occasional attempts, I think, but they're not consistent to engage uh, at the multilateral level. I think um, the United States finds ASEAN, and it's no secret, but the United States finds ASEAN quite a frustrating animal to deal with, and they haven't fi quite figured out how to ride that, I don't know, I, I don't know whether tiger is the right word for ASEAN, but they haven't quite figured out how to handle um, no, they were the They were the tigers in the 90s, right? Uh, uh, they were referred to as the economies that were fueling individual countries, I individual countries within the ASEAN. Um, so let me actually but wait, let me um, let me just follow up on that point. Um, so with the United States, we you know I think the perception is that um, Southeast um, South the perception from Southeast Asian countries is that the United States neglects um, ASEAN, and we have actually have concrete evidence of that. With the Biden administration coming in, they issued an interim national security strategic guidance. And in that, although it talked about you know wishing to deepen partnership with countries like Singapore and mm -hmm. Vietnam, mm -hmm. all mention of ASEAN in this respect was omitted. Um, this they're seeking to correct. I think they're aware of how you know ASEAN countries view their neglect, mm -hmm. and they're actually trying to address that in the recent uh, Indo-Pacific strategy issued in February. We have seen a little bit of a change, or rather a sea change, in so far as um, the United States is talking about ASEAN centrality and also supporting ASEAN initiatives. Mm -hmm. So I think they are aware and they're seeking to change how they uh, approach ASEAN. So recently, Lynn, we've heard from. Um, uh, spokespersons, or at least those, cl those close to the new government in South Korea in Seoul, that um, they may be considering joining the Quad. Mm -hmm. uh, you already have Japan, Australia, India, and the US mm -hmm. as part of that grouping. Uh, the big five mm -hmm. in that particular part of the world. And the whole new notion of the Indo-Pacific rather than the Asia-Pacific, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of enlarges the landscape of uh, politics. Mm -hmm. Do you believe this is crowding out uh, ASEAN's role in the old political map of the world, where the Asia-Pacific was the go-to geography and ASEAN was a key actor in that geography? In the Indo-Pacific, they are one of the actors, not necessarily uh, the important ones. Do you believe uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, and the Quad they're, they're from are beginning to, in some sense, challenge the identity of ASEAN. Is ASEAN, how, rather, let me put it this way, is ASEAN a receptive uh, collective to this particular emergence, or are they also finding ways to get along and coexist with this uh, new political buzzword, the Indo-Pacific? Hmm. Uh, that's um, a very interesting question. I think if we look at when um, you know this new Indo-Pacific, um, or rather this resurrected mm -hmm. or revitalized notion of the Indo-Pacific came about in around 2017, right? And it, I mean, it, w it existed prior to that. Mm -hmm. India, Japan, Australia, all you know talked about the Indo-Pacific region as well. But it really you know came to the forefront again mm -hmm. with the United States under the Trump administration in 2017. And um, uh, when that Indo-Pacific strategy or concept emerged. Uh, ASEAN and its member states was initially very wary about it, um, and they were wary about it for two main reasons. One was, you know, how is China going to be responding to this? I don't think, you know, they, their view is China is not going to like this, and therefore we should be really careful and cautious about this. And the second reason they were wary about it as well was that, you know, what will this uh, Indo-Pacific concept do to ASEAN centrality? We're now a small fish in a bigger mm -hmm. pond. Mm -hmm. um, since then, though, um, and of course with the Quad, uh, I think they were worried because the quadrilateral security dialogue was again despised by China and you know, it was considered a very muscular approach to uh, the problems of the region. Uh, since then we've had you know, ASEAN issue the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. A lot of people uh, regarded that as you know, ASEAN's acceptance of this Indo-Pacific strategy. 
But I think if you look closely at the document, it was just ASEAN expressing its views on Correct. the Indo-Pacific, which we, they weren't necessarily embracing or endorsing as their own. And I think they had to join in the conversation to shape this notion of the Indo-Pacific um, into something that they felt comfortable with. And they focused very much of, on economic integration, connectivity, et cetera, and eschewed all mention of more muscular elements uh, to that. Um, it's also become, um, however, what we've seen as well is that ASEAN has also become a little bit more comfortable with the quadrilateral security dialogue. I think once it shifted away from more security-based elements to things like you know, the production and distribution of COVID vaccines, and I think that was, um, India had an important role to play in that shift. Um, uh, I think ASEAN has become more comfortable with that. And if we look at the recent development, uh, the AUKUS deal, uh, ASEAN, in, in a sense, you know, there were two countries that were very worried. Uh, ASEAN had no official position on the AUKUS deal, but there were two countries in ASEAN that were very worried about it, Malaysia and Indonesia. They were worried about an arms race and power projection. But by and large, if we look at the other Southeast Asian countries, um, they were either expressly supportive, such as in the case of the Philippines, or implicitly supportive. And I think that stemmed from a recognition that ASEAN was, in a sense, unable to, you know, uh, to provide sufficient contributions to the power dynamics in the region and to balance power in the region. And so I think, you know, we had comments from, say, um, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong of Singapore, who said that, you know, uh, Singapore would welcome AUKUS if it uh, promoted peace and stability in the region and if it uh, was a complement to ASEAN. So, you know, there are some caveats there, as there should be, but generally um, it was a welcoming of something that perhaps, you know, we look at one or two years ago, perhaps that the, the region might have been far more cautious, cautious of. So, Lynn, I really want to thank you for joining us at the Raisina Dialogue and, of course, for this very illuminating conversation for many in India who uh, need to engage more deeply with ASEAN as a collective and of course Singapore uh, already is one of our most uh, significant and important partners. Um, uh, let me also uh, inform those who are watching this uh, particular uh, session that Lynn is uh, someone who puts together very, very interesting conversations um, in Singapore and uh, I want to wish you and your team the very best for the Shangri-La Dialogues. I hope uh, ASEAN and its future uh, is one of the core elements that are discussed there. And I will be watching those proceedings carefully to learn more about the region, which in my mind is certainly going to decide the nature of the political map of this particular part of the world and indeed the future of uh, the Indo-Pacific, the Quad, and any other groupings that want to work with and partner uh, with others in this particular geography. So thank you very much for joining us, Lynn. And I hope to have you back at Raisina again. Thank you so much, Samir, and thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to participate in the Raisina Dialogue. I thank you and your wonderful team for this um, dialogue. It discusses many important issues, but I think it, it goes beyond the intellectual contribution as well. I think there's something that you bring to the dialogue, that you and your team bring to the dialogue, that's warmth, that's humanity, and so I thank you for um, permitting me to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. Thank you.